Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield, the host of Manny Talk Shooting, and welcome to another episode. This is the shooting podcast where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you like this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Talk Shooting. And without further ado, let's get to this episode. The title sponsor of Manny Talk Shooting is Go Fast Don't Suck. So if you need match banners for your match, check them out. They also have an awesome selection of pre-designed and custom mobile jerseys. Don't forget, they are the home of the dry fire decals for your wall, so get those too. They've also got a plethora of patches and stickers that are hilarious and true. You know, Go Fast Don't Suck has a lot of things that you'll need on the range and off, so please check them out at GoFastDon'tSuck.net. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another installment of Manny Talk Shooting, the shooting podcast on the internet because that's how we live our lives. It's all remote technology. We do it from our homes. We're not cool like Brian Conley, who has a van, who just says, let's hop in my van and do a podcast. So we do it on the internet because we do and we can. Um, Tonight, sitting down with me is a man um, you might not know yet, but you will know after the show. Um, He keeps winning major matches back to back to back. It's Mr. Mike Wang. How you doing, Mike? Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having me on, man. No problem. It, it's been uh, it's been on the list, and uh, we're finally making it happen. I know we uh, we've talked to it. It's been about a month and a half now since we first started talking, so it's all good. We'll get this. We're gonna nail this one down. It's gonna be a bang up podcast. I can tell you that for sure. So, um, Mike. So for people who really don't know you, um, who are you, and how did you get into shooting? Oh, that's a that's a big question. Um, who am I? I'm just I'm just a guy that likes to shoot guns. Um, actually just started a few years ago about my first gun in 2018 um, and started competing in USPSA in 2019. So I haven't been doing this all that long uh, relative to you know some of the other guys, but uh, I have a great time doing it and I picked it up really fast and um, yeah, it's just a blast. So I just like to go out and shoot, um, you know, and, and just have a good time. That's all. Right. So Mike, how did, uh, what made you even find, you know, practical shooting? Like, did, was it a buddy or did you just find it on the internet? We just found it on the internet, man. Like you said, we're just living in the, that age right now. Um, <clears throat> I was living in Delaware at the time and I was uh, going to the range and renting a gun, renting a 1911 and shooting that on the flat range uh, like once or twice a year. And I randomly just looked up practical shooting. I can't remember where I saw it or where I found it, but I just started looking it up and looking up uh, matches and I found an IDPA match. Uh, that was about 10 minutes from me. So I went and borrowed some guys 19 were in there with like this leather holster and everything. Um, and there were like 30, 30, 40 guys there and just went and started winning the match somehow. They were doing like paper scoring. So they, uh, it was, it was pretty old school, but at the end of the night, I stormed with the, the guy's face. He was looking at me and said I won and I was just kind of blown away by that. But, um, ever since then I, uh, I started looking for matches wherever I went. Um, I actually didn't shoot another match after that for a while. I moved back to Virginia, where I'm from, for a little bit. About two weeks after I shot that match, I couldn't shoot anymore there, obviously. But um, didn't do any shooting there until I moved to Alabama a couple of years after that uh, for my wife's work. Just randomly bought a gun here and started looking at matches here again. Uh, found Hoover Tech, uh, the local range around here that sponsors me. And they were having a match run by some of my now really good friends and just started shooting from there and got second to last place at that first match. <laughs> um, again, with a 1911 that I bought. And, you know, the rest is history. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that's that's a lot to unpack. So, yeah, it's a lot. Um, so you lived in Virginia, you grew up in Virginia. Yep. I'm assuming you moved to Fairfax. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so I'm assuming you moved to Delaware for work or? I did. Work? So, yeah, I. Like I was born and raised in Fairfax, went to high school there. I went to college in Williamsburg, about two and a half hours south of where I grew up. And right after graduation, I got my first job in Delaware. So I did start working at J.P. Morgan up there just for a few years. Um, that's where I shot that that IDP match. And then I moved back to Virginia for two years to work there, then moved to Alabama. So that's kind of like my travel history or where I lived. Right. So... Um, what's the biggest, so, you know, living in Virginia growing up and then now living in Alabama, um, <laughs> what's the biggest stark difference between living in the two locations? Um, <laughs> there are a lot of answers to that. A lot of answers. I get that question a lot. I'm going to say the roads. The ro- <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, the roads are, uh, they're okay. They're okay. They're a little bumpier here. I just took an inside joke with me and some of my buddies here, but, um, it's honestly not as different as I thought it would be, but that's because of my ignorance, probably. Uh, when I first found out that we were moving to Alabama, 
I joke you not, I thought I was going to be like a farmhand or something for a while. I didn't realize that there was Wi-Fi down here. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> um, I, fa- I started looking for a job and surprisingly found them pretty quickly at a bank. One of the bigger banks around here, they, they got bought up by PNC, but it was called BBBA at the time. And uh, got a tech job there. Um, yeah, and started working there for a few years. Uh, but I guess one of the biggest differences, sorry, I kind of digressed a little bit. It's one of the good. biggest differences is probably, uh, I think just like the general like vibe in the atmosphere. I think people are pretty friendly here. Um, people don't really tend to talk to you randomly on the street up in Northern Virginia or DC, uh, where I used to work. Um, but here, everybody will just start a conversation with you. You know, if you like that, that's awesome. And if you don't, then it could be a nightmare for you. But um, I think it's awesome because people are really friendly. So uh, mm-hmm. that's a really cool thing about about this place. That is pretty cool. I mean, you know, yeah. and honestly, uh, you can't go wrong really when uh, you know people are nice. They want to chit chat with you, and uh, <laughs> you might uh, you might hear some banjos every once in a while when you're uh, out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> some banjos, or some you know some some old guitars and whatnot, some acoustic guitars, and some some country music. No, but I, I mean, I live in Birmingham right now. It's one of the bigger cities here, so it's honestly not that different. Like, it's not as different. It may be a little bit more uh, opportunity for growth in the city and whatnot. Um, people don't go out and hang out as much on like the week, uh, the weeknights and the weekends and everything. But um, when you do go out, it's a pretty good time. So, mm-hmm. I can imagine that. So, um, so you said you're in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Um, how far is that from CMP Talladega? It's like forty minutes, man. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is pre- that is pretty awesome, especially when you can you go to you can go to nationals and sleep in your own bed. It's yeah, it's pretty nutty, um, and they keep doing it at CMP, and I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> uh, some people actually don't like it because it doesn't feel like a major match. It just mm-hmm. feels like it literally just feels like three locals back to back. But um, like you said, just being able to come home and kind of gather your gather yourself in between days and, and whatnot and, you know, see the, see the, see the dogs and see the wife and everything is pretty awesome. And not having those like buffer days of travel and all that stuff is, is pretty sweet. Um, so definitely shooting handgun nets and open nets, uh, later mm-hmm. this year at CMP. That, that'll be pretty awesome. So, yeah. um, you said you, so you shot that IDPA match with that 1911 <laughs> when you came back into shooting practical shooting, um, what division did you, did you decide to shoot? So uh, uh, that first match back at, at Hoover Tactical was with a 1911 that I bought. I, I bought that gun, and then I shot the, the match like the next week. So it was very similar to that IDP gun. It was a silver 1911 in the Lord's Caliber, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was a good time. I only shot the one match with it, and then I bought a Shadow 2. <laughs> I bought a Shadow 2 and shot production for a couple of months, maybe more like three or four months. Um. And I knew that I just was not good at shooting iron sights. I could just tell. Um, I'd never, I'd never even shot a dot before, but I knew I wanted to go do a dot. I could just tell. Um, so I wrestled with myself on whether I should get my shadow cut for a dot. And back then they had the the more stringent weight limitation. I can't remember mm-hmm. what it was. I think it was forty five ounces. Could be wrong. But um, I was going to have to ship it off to Primary Arms and get them to do the slide lightning, lightning everything, um, or I could buy an open gun. And I was doing the math and everything, and I was trying to fudge the math to go towards the open gun. I think I really want, knew I wanted to do it. Um, it's just one of those things where, like, eventually I was just like, let's just do what I want. So um, got the open gun, got a STI, uh, DVC open, and uh, I've been shooting open ever since. I really don't um, verge too much and shoot other things, which... It helps me in some ways, but also hurts me if if I need to switch divisions or whatever, which I'm going to do a little bit more of this year as well. Um, but it makes me really good at what I do, which is shooting open. So, right. Well, and, and open is the one true division, right? Like, of course. I mean, it, it, you are, I see. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> well, if you think about it, you know, if 45 is the you know is you know John Moses Browning's caliber, but nine the nine major and 38 super comp have got to be higher than that on the list, right? Yeah. Make loud. Well, Make loud explosions. Yes, lower numbers, but you know, definitely, definitely up there. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, as we both know, we're both open shooters, and I, I, I love the loud booms, like the loud booms. But then there are sometimes you're shooting, and there's just really loud guns. But your gun is never the gun that's the problem, right? <laughs> that is always. Never. 
It's never. Although, actually, I think mine might be. <laughs> Everyone tells me that. But um, it's always worse when you're ROing. Like, when you're mm-hmm. standing, like, behind and to the side, it's always the worst for whatever reason. This is terrible. Um, I've got a buddy uh, that, that I shoot with a bunch that we say has the loudest gun, but I've, I've heard some other ones that are up there maybe a little bit even louder. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just tell them, what do you mean? It, it's not that loud. Don't yeah. like, <laughs> I usually just, I, I always give people crap and I'm like, it's not that loud. What are you talking about? Yeah. Leave me it's alone. really not. It's really not. Just, you know, yeah. Hey, let me just put more powder in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just get some hearing aids. It's fine. You'll, you'll be fine. Down the road. Yeah, exactly. They'll be fine. And I don't even, oh, I don't even double plug, right? Like I just wear, do I just, not? Wear, I just oh, wear, pl- I just wear, in, I just wear inner ears. I don't wear the the muffs. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what inner ears do you use, though? So I've been dabbling around. Right. I can't. I've I had a pair of in ears that were awesome. They were electronic. Um, they died. Like I could. They couldn't keep a charge. So I was like, all right, these going uh, in the trash. Okay. So then I went. What did I use then next? I think I bought some decibels. So just okay. You know, decibels. The cheap, yeah. Yep. The cheap molded ones. Yeah. And right now, I just I went to the Buckeye Blast, and Grizzly Ears was there, and I picked up a set of Grizzly Ears okay. to try out. Um, I do need to get like one of the. I either need to go to an audiologist and just get customs made, mm-hmm. or see if I can find Premier to match or something, and be like mold my ears because that's what really what I've been looking for yeah. is that custom fit. Um, but it just it never works out right. Like it's either they're not at the matches, the major matches I'm going to, or it just doesn't line up. Yeah, uh, Premiere is is awesome. I uh, I actually tried to use their product once a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a match, like you said, and they were there, and they custom molded and everything. I think I got the, the medium tier, not like the like the super high, like thirty three NRR. I think they have, but it was like the the medium tier. Mm-hmm. And this is like no fault of their own because a bunch of my friends have them and they like them. But for some reason, like my ear canal on my right, I think is weird. And I just couldn't get a seal in in this one. This one was fine. The right one, I had I had uh, I had the lady do it multiple times. Um, like the next time I saw it in match, I tried to get her to do it again, and um, I don't know. I could just like I could hear like the air coming in and out, so it wasn't like full seal. Mm. So they kindly refunded my money and um, said just it just didn't work out or whatever. But um, now I use the ISO tunes. I've been using the ISO tunes for a year now. Whenever I joined uh, the masterpiece team. And those calibers come with um, the different plugs, like the inserts, mm-hmm. and one of them just fits like perfectly. And it's a little bit oversized, so it just does a really good job of like filling that extra space. Um, but I was wearing just those for a while, and I think that there's something to like the vibrations that the noises make from the open guns that kind of mess with your the bones in your ears or something like that. I read a little bit about it, and so I just went back to doubling up. Um, and now there's just no issue at all, but not, I don't think there was before, but it's just a consideration, you know, like you don't really get your hearing back ever. So there's something I didn't really want to mess with. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, here, here losing our hearing is like the worst thing ever. Yeah. Like, and, and then when you shoot really loud guns, it, it's really, it, it can be a doozy on you. Yeah. I've already got some mild tinnitus from back in my younger years when I was playing a lot of drums and guitar and whatnot. I didn't wear any, any ear protection and just going to concerts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it didn't really bother me all that much. When I'm going to bed, I can totally notice it, but it's not so loud that it keeps me up or anything. Mm-hmm. But for those two to three months where I was only using the inners, I felt like it, the tinnitus was getting a little bit worse. I'm not really sure if it was, but um, definitely keep your, your ears protected. Um, I think is is a good idea. I did go to Costco and get a free hearing test. You should totally do that too if you have a Costco membership. Costco is life, so. You know. Right. Well, and I, I get very lucky due to the fact like I work where I work at is uh, a a chance of loud environment, so everyone gets a. Ah. Uh-huh. We do do a hearing test, but the worst part is you sit in the little booth with yeah. the little clickers, and you're like. Yeah. Did I hear something? <laughs> and you never know sometimes, you know? And sometimes you feel like you're cheating it. I did ask her that when I took my test. It was just recent. And uh, she said there's a way that she can know if we have, like, a false positive. I'm not really sure how. it's. It must be, like, a technique thing. But um, she said she would know, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. But apparently my ears are good. They're tip-top shape, so. There you go, right? So you can yeah. hear the little the little tings and the pings. And yeah, it's not going to go back to blasting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't worry about it. So... 
you said you started with a, a DVC open. Mm-hmm. Um, how long did you use that um, STI before upgrading? Which one? Because I've been through, <laughs> I've been through a few. So oh, really? Okay. They had, their, they had their, um, a little bit of issues with the STI uh, DVC open guns. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that one, like, they kind of, like, I don't know if they've acknowledged it, but I think they know and, and people just generally know. So that first one I had lasted right around 7,500 to 8,000 rounds and then the slide cracked right at the ejection port. Um, but they have an awesome warranty. Um, I think they still have it even as Staccato, but back then... Um, I talked to a guy and he was like, ship it in. And as soon as they looked at it, they shipped me a brand new gun pretty much immediately. So like one or two weeks downtime, downtime, and I got a brand new gun. Um, that one eventually cracked as well, closer to 20,000 rounds. And then they shipped me another brand new gun and they shipped it to me like two years after they stopped making open guns, like two years after they became staccato. I learned that they were still for some time making parts for that gun just for warranty purposes, which is awesome. I mean, that's, that's great practice. So, um, um, so kudos to them, but I got a new gun and then eventually ended up selling it to a buddy. Uh, but I shot that gun. I want to say like a year maybe Mm -hmm. before I, uh, bought some new guns from infinity. I mean, I shot those for a couple of years. Mm hmm. Yeah, and then uh, and then when I joined the masterpiece team last year is when I obviously switched to the masterpiece gun, um, and then sold my infinities. So, right. So your infinities um, were very colorful, right? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> now, did you colorful, get yeah. those? Did you get those secondhand, or did you did you no. order those? No, I ordered those. Yeah, I figured uh, the 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 SVs don't really lose their value all that much. Like they they retain their value pretty decently. So, um, you can spend another thousand and just get a brand new gun. I feel like the, that's, the, that's about the price difference, I think. So, yeah. Right. No. And, and yeah, that's true. And, and you know, the cool thing is, you know, you got picked up by masterpiece. You can have two guns for the price of one infinity. You sure can. Yeah. <clears throat> so, at, so how, out of your two, out of your old SVs, which one was your favorite? The silver one or the, the, the pink one? You've done your research. I like mm-hmm. that. Um, so the pink one was a hundred percent for me. Like it, it, it ran super well. Um, I had a few issues with the blue one at the time. I think I got them kind of fixed before I got, you know, before I sold them. Um, but if you look through some of my old videos, there's, there's some footage of, uh, of some manipulation practice, let's say. <laughs> so, right. um, so, uh, that one, I think, was maybe one of their earlier nine major guns. And I, I remember that they weren't advertising on the site at the time either. That was the first one I got. Um, and I ended up getting their, their, uh, upgraded, um, extractor, like the breach face extractor. And that alleviated a bunch of the issues that I had. Um, mm-hmm. so that helped for sure. Um, but then I had to swap my gun at nationals a couple of years ago on like the third stage. So the, the pink one was really good for me. Um, yeah, that one I didn't have any issues with. I got that one about a year after I got the blue one. Um, not sure if anything had to do with that, but uh, yeah, that one was the good one. Right. So from looking at those guns, was the blue one was that a thirty eight super comp or was that also a nine? I had major? both barrels for that one, so okay. I ended up paying for another barrel for that one, and I ended up paying for a third barrel down the road. But <laughs> um, that's that's a different story. But um, I had both, and I generally shot. I tried to shoot 38 super comp for majors, but it's also kind of weird, you know, practicing in one and then switching to another. Um, some people are good at that type of thing, but I like to be really in tune with the recoil impulse and everything. So it ended up just being like, I wanted to practice a month before. And then at a certain point you shoot so many majors that that's just like 24 seven. So, mm-hmm. um, so, yeah. So nowadays, you know, we'll talk current times. You're on team MPA. It's been a year now. Um, are you shooting nine or 38? I'm shooting nine exclusively. I again, I have a 38 super comp barrel for one of my guns, mm-hmm. and I keep telling myself I'm going to experiment it with it. But I've just had no problem with the nine major, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, I've shot a decent number of 38 super comp rounds, and I know how they feel. I know I know how they shoot, and I, I know how the dot tracks. Um, and I think the nine major is just good for me for now. I don't know. There may come a time where I maybe invest a little bit more time in, in testing out that 38 super comp barrel 
and seeing how I like that. Um, I did shoot 50 rounds through it one day with some Ely ammo about a year ago when I first got it. And I don't know if it was making power factor through my, and not, not saying anything like, you know, like it's always made power factor through my other guns, but it's every barrel is different, right? So I didn't mm-hmm. chrono it, so I just didn't know what it was. Um, it felt super soft. So maybe it's just a really soft load. I didn't get to chrono it or anything. I probably should do that. Um, but I just didn't know what it was, what power factor was shooting at and, and whatnot. And I just, I was shooting majors at the time, so I just didn't mess with it. Right. <clears throat> well, and now do you, um, when you, when you started it, well, this whole time, right? I'll rephrase this question a little bit, but oh, this whole time you've been shooting nine major. Is it always been new brass once fired brass or my favorite range pickup? I'm super cheap, man. <laughs> I'm so cheap. Um, so yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the perks of my Hoover tactical membership there in indoor range and, and gun store, Mm-hmm. Uh, local to me uh, one of the perks was um, getting brass from them and so I would get whatever brass random people would shoot at that range <laughs> and reload that now um, every once in a while I would buy some brand new brass for majors like nationals and whatnot but I, I don't know I- I've like throughout the years I've had jams with brand new brass that were totally like brass related mm-hmm. and so at a certain point I was just like I shoot like however many tens of thousands of rounds a year with this second or third or maybe 15th shot brass from Hoover Tactical. Like, and I'm still getting jams with the new brass. Like, what's the point? So I kind of just, uh, at a certain point, just started shooting that. But um, nowadays I'm shooting um, Excalibur ammo. So mm-hmm. um, that's not really a, uh, like something I have to worry about as much anymore. Right. Now, um, are you shooting that for all of your ammo or are you just using that for matches? I'm shooting it for all of my ammo now. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I've been chatting with Rob for a few months now uh, at Excalibur. I think I met him at Ipsic Nationals, not this not this recent one, but the one before in Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, super stand-up dude. We were chatting for like 30, 45 minutes, um, and uh, we got along really well, and we started just talking about um, just using some ammo, and so I started just testing it out, and this was, like, once I, once I shot it, I knew that this was just, like, ammo that I was going to shoot. Um, so we've been chatting for a little bit, Um and yeah, I'm just shooting his ammo full time now. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> now you, I'm assu- I know he's got um, nine minor, um, yes. but how is the major through your gun? Oh, it's great. Um, it's very similar to the load I was shooting before that I liked a lot. Um, I was loading silhouette before, and okay. oh yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've gotten that reaction before, but I like silhouette. It's for so, me. So- True yeah. story. I just started loading silhouette. So oh, nice, nice. Okay, yeah. because I'm cheap and I don't. I was using three and thirty eight for the longest time, and I'm like out of nine major. Yeah, I okay. yeah. I know a few people that that do that. I've never tried that. I used three and thirty eight for super comp, but I've never tried a nine <laughs> major before. Out of my gun, I could also well, Buckeye blast. You know, two a couple days ago, one seventy seven power factor with nine point two grains of three and thirty eight on a one twenty four. Oh. So you could bump it down quite a bit. I mean, I'm sure that's a pretty compressed load, right? Well, yeah, yeah. There's nothing you can really do about it. <laughs> that that yeah. is a very compressed load. Yeah. But uh, um, the, it was it works well. Uh, but now I uh, I didn't have enough time to go out to. The, that's the problem living where I live. You never know how the temperature is really going to affect your load data. So I kind of wait until like May or June to really get like new load data. Mm-hmm. So I. Had I got courtesy chronoed after I'd shot the whole match, and I'm like, "Here, I want it. To, I, I'm lazy. You have a lab radar set up. Please shoot my gun again." <laughs> okay. So then uh, my new silhouette load is uh, 170 power factor. Oh, good. That's perfect. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's that's perfect. Um, I really like the silhouette load. I spent a lot of time, like a freakish amount of time, testing a bunch. Uh, well, two powders really, that and accurate seven, and then a different, a bunch of different recoil springs. Um, two different barrels that I got from Masterpiece when I first started. They had like a nine port version that some people use, and it really um, it's not really like the the stock version, but I think it's something you can request. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, at the end of the day, after like ten hours of testing and tuning over like two range trips in a week, I shot like a thousand rounds, and I went back to everything stock. Like <laughs> everything stock was perfect, and I, I landed on the silhouette load. Um, so that's really cool that you're loading that now. You should tell me how uh, tell me how you like it once you shot a little bit more. 
Yep. So speaking of that, I'm gonna I've got a, a class that I'm taking, and I'm gonna, I got to start loading ammo for that here. <laughs> so I'm just like my just shoulder... like mid podcast, just gonna turn and start loading at some point. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's directly below me. So I'm on the first floor. <laughs> the the reloading room's below me, but uh, I'm not fancy quite yet to uh have an automated press where I can just. I like... never did either, man. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, I mean, is I I love the fact the idea that you can automate something. It's just also like, am I gonna load enough rounds to make my return on investment? That's that's always the hardest part, right? Like, you know, you know where I'm at now, shooting maybe ten to fifteen thousand rounds a year. It's like, yeah, it'd be nice to have it, but I'm also like, I'm not dying when I load ammo. Like, I'll I'll load five hundred, four hundred, five hundred rounds up at a time, and I'm like, okay, I'll I'll survive for a little while. Yeah, that's kind of how I did it. Like it, it didn't, it didn't bother me at all to load like 500 rounds in, in an evening, right? And you know, I don't have kids or anything, so I probably have a little bit more free time than than a lot of other guys. So I definitely think automating is the way to go for sure. Um, but it's just not something that I ever, like you said, I just, um, I didn't feel the need to get away from the manual loading personally. So I just never did. Right. My thing is, as soon as I get the press all spun up, like I've got all the tubes loaded, I'm just ready to go. Like that's, uh-huh. it's like I don't need to. I'm not one of those. Oh, I'll load a tube and then I'll stop and then, uh, you know, I'll start loading ammo and then load another tube. So, although I would say a primer tube filler would be nice. Like I, I, I'm not gonna lie, that would be handy. That was gonna be my next purchase, um, but I do have nine primer pickup tubes, mm-hmm. so I could just do like a brick of a thousand or whatever a thousand is called. Yeah, that's called a brick. Um, mm-hmm. I would just load pretty much the full thousand and then I'd be good to go for like two loading sessions. And yep. so, yeah, that's the way. That is the way really. I mean, just chug it along, right? Make it, make it roll. Yep. So, um, so <clears throat> Oh, that's where I was going with this. So, you know, you're not loading any ammo anymore, but, uh, you're still, you know, you've been shooting open this whole time. Pretty much you've dabbled a little bit in carry optics. Um, was that just because you wanted to shoot a nationals? Or? We don't want to talk about carry optics. <laughs> <laughs> you learned your lesson. We went back to the, 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 the well, right side, right? This old man hasn't learned his lesson because I'm going to shoot handgun nats, but it's very different. So, okay. You can I shoot mean, 2011, though, in handgun nationals. Exactly, exactly. So I think it'll be, you know, hopefully it'll be a little different than carry optics nationals for me. But um, mm. let me explain myself here. So carry optics nationals, I can't remember what year that was, like 2022? 2021 when i shot that one mm, i'm betting 21 it's but I, I bet it's been that long it's 21 or 22 i don't know well it never happened so like i don't know what we're talking about here but uh, <laughs> no so it was at cmp it was 40 minutes away from my house and i have a shadow too i still had a shadow too and i had just put a dot on it um even though i had never really shot any rounds through it with a dot and um i was like what the heck might as well shoot it let's just go and I didn't like walk stages. I, I went and I just walked a few, but I was just kind of like, eh, that'll be fine. That'll be fine. I kind of like, I needed to take it a little bit more seriously and I didn't, but, um, I was kind of just there to have a good time. And, um, and so that was the mental aspect. And then from the technical aspect, um, I don't know what it is, but that shadow too, just doesn't like for me personally, like doesn't really fit my hands all that well. Like the grip angle is a little bit different than what I'm used to. And, um, I really think that the, grips that I had on the gun, the, um, the log palm swell, which I know, I know a ton of people love those, but I think just for me personally, I think they're a little bit too thick. Like I got, I got the really thick ones. Mm-hmm. And, um, when I'm holding the gun and putting my hands around it, the grip is perfect. But if there's any variation in my grip at all, then the whole thing just kind of felt off. So when you're drawing under time, your grip's not going to be a hundred percent perfect every single time. Um, and so there were just so many times where I would bring my gun up and like my bot, my dot would be like out of the window or something. Oh, and it was just weird, just a weird match for me. Um, and I was just there having a good time. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. I'm just making a bunch of excuses what I'm doing, but <laughs> but handgun nationals will be different because I have an identical gun, but it's in minor uh, with a slide right dot, and uh, it's gonna be a good time. So yeah. Right, so I noticed, um, at least scrolling through the Instagram, your limited optics gun does have a thumb rest on it. Um, the, the right here, right here. Uh, see that? And that's where, where that's, that's just that's a pretty color colorway, right? The the thank silver you. and the blue. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I like it a lot. It's awesome. So, um, is the th- like? Do you find that you really need the thumb rest for minor, or is it just like to be similar with the open guns? Uh, 
both. So I want it to be as similar as possible. So I actually got, um, if you can see it right there, I actually got David and company to make me a spacer. So like it even mimics the, the frame that it would normally be on. Um, so that is really cool. Now, I don't, I don't think that the thumb rest enhances my performance in any way, even in open, really. Like, I don't, I don't like, I don't manipulate in such a way that, um, it like enhances my recall or anything. In fact, if I find that sometimes if I push too hard on it in certain ways by accident, my dot actually starts to shift to the, like over to the right a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. the reason I need a thumb rest is because if I shoot a 2011 without a thumb rest, I will stop the slide. Like I've tried it before, and just the way that I torque my thumb in, um, I just torque it right into the into the into the slide, and it'll start rubbing on the um, all the uh, the slide serrations and everything, and stop the slide on me. So mm -hmm. it hasn't happened on this gun, obviously. But um, I I shot uh, I shot uh, Lim Ten Nationals a couple of years ago as well, and um, and speaking of Brian, man, that, that guy's awesome because. I went up to him and he had this really nice black 2011. It was like black and gold. And I can't remember uh, who made it for him, unfortunately, but uh, he was, he let me borrow that gun for the match. And I went to the test fire bay and I kept, it kept jamming on me. And I realized I was sl stopping the slide with my thumb. So I had to give it back to him, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that's when I found out I need the thumb rest. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, especially how I think about it. Like I know a lot of open shooters who don't even have thumb rest, but I'm like, yeah. the thing is like a, built on prop like a barrel's table start i don't have to get my hand underneath the gun i just yeah. put the gun up with my strong hand that is that is a hidden benefit a very very nice hidden benefit for sure um so that that is definitely good but yeah i, I really don't think that the thumb rest makes your recoil impulse any better i actually know a lot of people that took their thumb rest off because they kept having that dot moving off to the side one way or the other um mm -hmm. so they don't like it but for me I, I mean i could relearn how to grip the gun or i could just keep the thumb rest so it's fine that's easier Right. So, um, when you were as your whole time in open, and uh, how many times have you you lost a thumbnail to uh, the slide racker? Never. I never. I don't have that issue. Yeah, I have, I have plenty of other issues, like plenty of other <laughs> weird things for me, but that's not one of them. Um, I have a um, here my hands. This is the uh, the money maker right here. This is the one I'm always using at every match. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that my slide racker is actually very low. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, just the way I grip it like this, like it, it just never gets in the way. My 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 thumb always is smacked down on the safety. Like, you know, as soon as I start the stage, it's just right on there. So it never gets in the way. It's always good. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, then you see a lot of shooters who have got those ape hanger like... Uh, I know. Or like uh, Ch my buddy Chase Reigns, he's got like this... It's not an ape hanger, but it's essentially like a really long stick that sticks off the gun. And I'm like... <laughs> Or even like team member, what Chris, Chris Britt, is, you know, his, his racker is really weird too, but he's a lefty. So he, he, he definitely he just weird all around. I'm just playing. I love Chris. He's awesome. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he knows it though. He knows that he's, he's that weird left handed <laughs> okay. kid. He's like, he's my like, wife oh, is a lefty. So, you know. Yeah, it, you know, and it's so weird, right? You, so we can we shoot we shoot stages weekend only sometimes. I tried to shoot like a Glock or something left handed. And I'm just like, this is too foreign. I'm like, I feel like I'm gonna drop the like. You know, you have good fundamentals, but it's like this is so weird. Like I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah, it's definitely weird. I, I do think on the strong hand stages though, or strong like one handed stages, um, being able to ha like having that lighter gun sometimes I think is a is a plus right because mm -hmm. the recoil doesn't matter as much because you're well it does but um you're you're really taking your time to get those shots in um but then on the transitions it definitely benefits you a bunch because you've only got the one hand to manipulate the gun with so mm -hmm. um, right well and yeah and then when you got a freaking 57 ounce gun and it's just like oh i gotta hold this thing with one hand and shoot <laughs> yeah 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 get tired on those um only one hand stages for sure well, at least, yeah, at least that weekend only. It's like, oh, wait. Uh, uh, uh. But, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I, I definitely have a suite of, I just have, like, I don't know. So, um, sometimes you get a little bit of pinch. It's just the way my sh my hand is shaped. I guess I'm just a little fleshier on, on certain parts of my hand. But, like, when I put the safety down, sometimes it pinches my, and this is with, like, any gun, really, but pinches my, my hand, like, right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I am someone that, 
cannot have a mag button on his gun because I will drop my mags no matter what. I've tried so many different mag buttons. Eventually, I just bought um, some thumb screws on a uh, McMaster car, I think it's called, mm-hmm. and just drilled, like, dremeled them down to be this just tiny little button. Like, you can see it's barely anything. Um, this is what it takes for me not to drop my mag on a stage, basically, with my left hand. Um, so I have that. And then I actually have to get these, like, safeties that are trimmed down a little bit normally they stick out a little bit more on the um, on these guns just stick mm-hmm. out a little bit but i get them to trim down all of mine because for whatever reason when i put my hand like this uh like it it like hits my thumb right here and it hurts really bad when i'm shooting like it's kind of like pushing right into the bony part of my thumb so i don't know i just get, i got weird hands i guess but <laughs> Hey, nothing wrong with weird hands. I mean, you're, you're already live in Alabama. I mean, it could only could get worse. <laughs> yes, I almost get you to spit. You almost got me spit my drink out, bro. Oh, I know. That's, <laughs> and that's never the intention, but it's always a bonus, right? But, um, so, you know, we talked about this indoor range a little bit, um, but uh, you know, where do you normally like if you're gonna go shoot a match? Where are you gonna go shoot a match at? Okay, um, so we st- we used to have a lot of matches around here, or more than we do now. We, we used to have at least one every Saturday mm-hmm. a month. Um, with COVID, uh, one of them, uh, st- you know, stopped happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, t- sorry, two of them stopped happening, and one of them just recently came back, like just this year. Um, not really sure how long that one was going to go, though. I think the MD, um, he's been not striking for a while. And just coming back into it, it's, it's pretty tough. I mean, um, I've been in MD2, and I, I still am, but um, doing it is pretty tough. It's a fully volunteer sport, and it's a lot of work, so I totally get it. Um, our match, the Brock Scat match, which is also my training area, uh, is still doing our monthly match there. And then CMP is actually... Uh, so Candice, you know Candice? Um, mm-hmm. She's like she's always ROing and everything. She, she's awesome. Um so she took that match on about a year ago, but I think she's going to be moving on. And I, I don't know, um, like what she's told other people, like what, if that's public information, yes, I won't go too much into details on it, but I think she's kind of moving on and doing some other things. So we might have somebody to replace her uh, locally. Um, and I think he will take it and he'll do a great job if he does, but, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we're just down to like the two matches now, the CMP match and then our Brock Scott match and, the indoor match uh, happens usually about every other week. Um, it's scheduled every week, but it just kind of depends on how many people we get. So that's every Thursday. Right. So so you mentioned Brock's Gap. Now yeah. you're are you just part of the team, or are you the the lead? Are you a lead guy, or what is what is it? Are you? Um, there are four of us, mm-hmm. and uh, Chase Chase is also one of my Hoover Tactical teammates. Um, Chase Lane. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have been doing it a little bit more. Uh, nowadays, Connor and Chris are the other guys that we added on just in the last year. And they are running the setup and doing a lot of that. So they're really pulling their weight on, on doing the stage design and the setup and everything, which is awesome. And um, Chase and I help them with running the match and some admin things and, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit dynamic change, just a little bit. Yeah. Right. Well, and you know, nothing's ever going to be the same forever, right? We always know things are going to always change. There's always, there's usually always club drama or you know range drama, and it's like, mm-hmm. or or life, right? Life always gets in the way. It seems like you know you always could have a good thing, and then it's like, oh, life's changed. I've got to work more or shoot less, right? It's one of the. It's always one of those things. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. So, um, with being a part of the the Brox Gap match, um. How, um, how's that experience been? Has it been um, overall pretty well, or uh, has it been uh, bumpy for you? Like running the match? Yeah. Oh, it it was awesome. I loved doing it. I was super passionate about it. Um, you know, still am. Um, loved making awesome stages for people, and I had a ton of people that would always come up to me and tell me how awesome the stages were. Maybe they were just being nice, but um, <laughs> I, I, I do feel like we put a lot of effort into those stages, and, and people would travel like two to three hours. You know, we had a bunch of Atlanta people that would come in and shoot our match. And so that really said a lot, I think, and they're still coming, which is awesome. So we know that Connor and Chris are doing a great job, um, that they've taken the, taken over the stages and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it was a really good time. Um, and still is obviously, but, uh, especially with the, the setup and everything, we don't do that quite as much anymore. Chase and I specifically, mm-hmm. but, um, we had some pretty good times doing that stuff. Um, right. it was awesome. 
Um, and then running the match itself is awesome too. I mean, um, seeing people kind of travel from all over, like 70, 80 people and just coming to shoot this match is it's pretty awesome. It's cool. So. Mm-hmm. That is pretty cool. 70, 80 people is pretty awesome. Now, I heard we, we had dog noise a second ago. Uh, what kind of doggo? So, I, I, who told me this? Somebody told me that you're a corgi runner. D- I, yes. Um, yes, I am. I, I had two. I lost one about a year oh, ago. Sorry. And, but I still have my mail. He's uh, he's entertaining the family. So. I've, got, I've got two corgis myself. Okay. See, mine were both uh, red-headed tricolors. Okay. Okay. But, um... I, I don't know. The wife's been talking about getting another dog, so I don't you know. You should if, do it. Just totally do it. Well, and we have a really good relationship with the breeder we got our male from. Yeah. So I will, I'll be honest with everyone on the podcast. I, when I got my female, she was one of those – somebody got them and not really knew – didn't realize the breed was not for them and they're a small, fa- you know, they're small kid family. And it's like, it's like, okay, I will – and it was a co-worker's family. And like they're like, will you take this dog? I'm like – you say what you want to let me take this corgi from you and have a second one? <laughs> Absolutely. So, and the funny part is, um, Mike is my male is forty pounds, solid muscle. Oh, my female is big for a corgi. Well, and he's not fat at all. He's just yeah. he is solid as a brick. And then my little female I had um, before she passed away, she was maybe nineteen twenty pounds. So she was oh, a wow. teacup, and he was massive. So, I, so everyone would ask, "Oh, I want a corgi." I'm like, "All right, you'll get something in the middle." <laughs> like, like you won't get her size i mean and she was adorably small yeah but and then he was just like massive and i'm just like yeah you won't get these are the far ends of the spectrum here people yeah yeah i've got a buddy zach who's got two corgis as well and his are much smaller than mine are mine are right in like that 28 to 30 pound range just like mm-hmm. a pretty standard size i think um but yeah i, I definitely like having two mm-hmm. um my their, their names are basil and ginger basil's basil's the boy he's the older one and ginger's the the little girl but she's definitely the boss of the whole house female corgis definitely are the boss right yeah yeah she's more like a cat she's, she's like a catty dog uh-huh which is cool because i like cats too well and and when my female was she would bark she would sit at the back door and just bark like she'd hear some noise and bark that's and, what they're doing right now and, and then he he when she passed away he kept doing it i'm like dude no one's here like <laughs> There's nothing you got. You don't got to bark. There's fine. Maybe someone is there and they're they're warding them off every time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the worst part is like I'm in the kitchen with him and he's like he's barking for nothing. I'm like, dude, the neighbor didn't even get home. Like you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, when the UPS guy comes around, it's definitely the loudest. But they will like I literally have a window to my. They actually watch the front, mm-hmm. and I will look out and there's nobody there. Not another dog. Not a human. Nothing. Like I don't know what they're barking about. Maybe the. Uh, there's like a chipmunk, I think, that lives back there, and there's a, a lizard or a gecko or something. Mm-hmm. I think that's maybe what they're barking at. But um, when I when I first brought Ginger home, uh, mm-hmm. she was a COVID dog, so she's also terribly trained, obviously. But uh, <laughs> the first thing she did was um, tear up the little like we, we had these windows, um, like these full size windows next to our doors. Mm-hmm. And when we moved into the house, they had um, like one of those like sticky like. So, so you can't see through the window. I don't know what it's called, but like a little like screen protector type thing or whatever. And she like tore that up in one corner. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, and she, she actually chewed up some of the molding there on the door as well. I think she was trying to like create a hole so she could see what was going on out there. <laughs> so she literally surveys the neighborhood through the little like hole, like the little whatever in the glass that she made. <laughs> and when I, when I drive home, I can see her like just crouching down, peering through it, waiting for me to come home. And then as soon as she, she confirms it's me, she will like sprint to the garage door. It's the cutest thing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and they know. Depending on what noises that car is making, yeah. who's who's rolling into the driveway or in the garage? It's yeah. Sometimes I'll shift into a different gear just to like throw them off every time. See if see if she'll catch me. See if I'll catch her sleeping. Keep catch her slacking. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Corgos are, Corgos are the best. I mean, yeah. they, they really are. Definitely. <laughs> Now I'm well. I'm you're, they're corgis, so they're super food motivated, aren't they? Um, the boy is 100. percent The girl is more more play motivated than food, which is which is funny. Mm-hmm. But she she likes play. He likes food. Um, obviously they both want like the steak or the bacon or whatever from the table, but mm-hmm. she will choose play over over food every time. Right. Yeah. yeah my. Uh, I could never get my male to play fetch. You just want to keep the ball or keep it away from me. But she would actually go fetch the ball and bring it back. But that's so funny. I had to like I spent like months teaching Basil how to fetch because he would do the same thing. But eventually, I taught him to do it. Ginger just immediately knew how to fetch the ball and bring it back to me. 
but she never brings it like to me. She brings it like a yard and a half away from me, like just enough to where it's annoying to have to grab it. So she always does the ball and then brings it like two yards away and then Basil picks it up and then brings it right to me. So it's a really good team effort. Let me go. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we played team fetch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. God, I, I love, I love corgis. They've got so much personality. Like, I mean, other dogs have personality, but corgis and like as a breed are just like so spunky. Like that's why there's so many Instagram pages with corgis on them. I know. Oh, you can see Basil right now. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I see Basil has like a nub, right? Do so both of your dogs have nubs or no? Or... She she doesn't. She was actually don't let don't tell her this, but she was like a show dog reject. So like her 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 like the the guy that bred her uh, mm-hmm. breeds a ton of show dogs. And she and one other uh, bluey girl actually mm-hmm. uh, were rejects from. I don't know if it was like the whole litter or I don't know what the deal was, but um, I mean, so so she had all that stuff uh, cut off. But I was really observant of you that you saw that as soon as you walked by. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, like so, my dog, my male, had nothing. Like his tail was docked when he was young too, so he had maybe a nub, but then it was docked when he or like soon after he was born. Yeah. But um, because he had papers and we never decided to show him because I didn't have time to show a dog or train a dog to be shown. Like, you know, you know, people in competitive shooting are super nice. You know, people in dog showing are not that nice. Uh, I, I'm not surprised. Like, I 100% take your word for it. Yeah. I mean, I will say, you, like, the people you, you know, who you get your dog from, your breeder, and those people, you know, their friends are probably really nice. But when it, there's money on the line showing dogs, <laughs> they're like, uh-uh. So I'm gonna take that money, but uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why everyone's so nice in competitive shooting because there's <laughs> well, you're not you're not shooting for like a million dollars, so <laughs> right. I mean, you might, yeah, <laughs> and it's very odd to find a cash payout match where you're like yeah. you're in some money, yeah. But um, so I mean, as much as I'd love to talk corgis the whole rest of the show, uh, people would be like, people would be like, why are we talking about corgis? Yeah, um, you guys have a different podcast for that one. Manny talks corgis. Manny talks corgis. Like it's funny enough. So I move. So I should this. So there's one of my there's my dog's like little lay bed like in the daytime. So his crate is normally next to this, yeah. and there's like a little plastic. It's about a foam core corgi looking thing that sits on the crate. Yeah. So I, I kick it out of the shot because I'm just like. People don't want to watch a corgi stare at like this fake yeah. corgi stare at them. But uh, you like how I roped you right back into it though. <laughs> it's okay. I, I mean, like I, I could always talk about corgis. But um, so you said so you were running the matches. Chase was running matches, and you said what? Chris and Connor, right? Chris and Connor are the new guys. Yeah, they're doing so, awesome. So Chris, you meet like Chris Cole, right? You know Chris? Oh wait, yeah. wait. actually, Let- you, you used to shoot with him up in Chicago. Nope. So I we no. we know mutual friends, yeah. but yes. So. And I always make fun of Chris because he's left-handed, and uh, yes. Um, so at least he's designing stages that are "quote unquote" left-handed friendly, right? Because he's like, <laughs> "Oh, I gotta shoot it too." <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So Chris and I have enough mutual friends. His his mom before she passed away uh, lived up in Lansing, kind of near my uh, my new home club. So okay. it was always nice because he'd come up and shoot Area Five up here, and then yeah. go see go see mom. So yeah, he just did that this year, right? Or, well, not this year, but last year. Yeah, yep. He was up here. I saw him in June. I don't think it was June. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm so I I think the next time I will see him is actually at Kentucky. Oh, that's just so. in a few weeks. Oh, well, no. I'm I'm ahead of myself a little bit. Never mind. By the time this comes it's out in a, a couple weeks. But yes, it's about just over oh, a yeah. month away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Area 8 is about a month away too though. In Yeah. Are you shooting Area 8? I'm not. I wish I were shooting more area matches this year, but I I don't think I can. I think I just have a, a conflict with Area 8 and Area 2 and 3. I'm not really sure. I'm shooting Area 5 and 6. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Area 5 will be a good time for sure. Uh, we've already been talking. Me and the, the mat. I'm not a match director for that match, but the, the guys who are in charge of that uh, talk fairly regularly. So that match will be a, a good solid match for all the shooters. So good. Yeah, I've never been to that range yet, so it'll be a good time for sure. I've heard yep. a lot of good things. Well, and if you talk to David or Greg, um, they shot – well, at least Greg shot Buckeye Blast last year. Yeah. And David, I think – well, Greg probably shot Limited Optics Nationals too. So mm-hmm. they knew Cardinal, um, the one bays, the wood slatted bays were only 100% downrange. But at Buckeye Blast, they laid out new ways to lay out those bays – Using steel plates and horse stall mats to create essentially a three a two hundred you know a normal shooting bay. Oh, okay. With, That's so, why they had all that 
like backing steel. I saw some of those targets. Yep. So yeah, that that makes it just like it's a normal stage, which is really cool because you can. There's no restriction then. Yeah. They just. It's kind of weird shooting paper and hearing tings though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the most time I'd ever remember that is when you're shooting like hard, like you're shooting an activator and there's hardcover steel to protect it. And that's what it sounds like. You're just dinging on that hardcover steel instead of the, the actual paper or the swinger you're supposed to hit. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is weird. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely is. The, I think the most, uh, the craziest one I shot, I think this is at Kentucky a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Or it, it was some, I think it was at, at Laves Range. I can't remember if it was Kentucky State or if it was an area match, but there was like a 30 yard target that was surrounded by black hardcover, like all of it, like above to the left and right and, and, and back. And then there was one behind it as well. So you didn't know if you hit the, the, the hardcover around it or if you actually hit the target. You just really had to call it a shot, I guess. But um, it was definitely weird. Um, and if you didn't know that there was a hardcover behind that target, then you'd be kind of wondering why you kept missing it. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's always the. <laughs> that's always the fun of it right <laughs> yeah <fun>. so <laughs> so you uh you know you just mentioned you're gonna be at uh you're you're gonna be at area five what other major matches are you looking to hit this year besides uh well i guess area five in kentucky because we already talked about them yeah i after after those matches i've got a little bit of a break i think i'm shooting limited optics for those matches mm-hmm. or sorry not for area five i think i'm switching back to open for area five but for kentucky state i i plan to shoot limited optics um and then i'll shoot area five and six which are like one or two weeks apart from each other Mm -hmm. and then going right back to limited optics for handgun nets and then right back to open again for a bunch of majors i'm actually going to go up to northern virginia again in september and shoot three majors in one week which is it sounds really daunting but i'm going to try to do it um because we've got Maryland and Virginia State back to back, and then there's another one called Intergalactic Falling Steel. It's like a falling steel match, um, the same weekend as Maryland State. So I'm going to shoot both of those in one weekend. Um, yeah, and then obviously Open Nationals after that. And I think I'm going to sh- shoot Area Two as well. That was a pretty cool range out in Phoenix. It was kind of hot, um, a little dusty, but uh, they put on some pretty good stages, and I liked it. So um, that one's out by itself in November, and I think I'm going to shoot that one as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'll be a cool match to shoot as well. That that'll mm-hmm. be a hoot. Yeah. But um <clears throat> so with your dabbling between limited optics and open, um are you gonna have to spend a lot of time switching between platforms to kind of be ready or is it kinda yeah. hopefully feel the same? No, so um <laughs> I wish. Uh so you know, like I said, I'm a total one troop pony. I've only really shot open for the lot for the five or six years I've been shooting. And um, I shot a little bit growing up, just going in the flat range, I don't know, probably 10 times in my life before I, I bought that first gun in 2018. Um, I used to go with my dad every once in a while, but I wasn't one of those kids. I grew up shooting guns or shooting all different kinds of guns or whatever. I would, I would always shoot a 1911 when I did, um, sometimes a Glock. And so I'm, I'm not very good at shooting or changing between guns, um, mm-hmm. especially a, a completely different platform like that Shadow 2. But um even between the the minor and the major gun, I'm just so in tune with that open gun. Um, and the Slimit Optics gun with the steel grip and everything is very heavy. And with the right load, it feels very similar. I think it's probably more so the um, the minor power factor scoring that you have to be a little bit more uh, careful with. Um, you actually have to aim a little bit when you're shooting minor, so that's a challenge for me. But um, <laughs> It's just it's just trying to it's just trying to switch back and forth and, get, and getting used to the different tempos. I think. I mean, open is just a completely different sport. Um, it's just a totally different game. So um, it doesn't take all that much, I don't think, to switch back and forth. But we'll see. Um, mm-hmm. I'll just have to. I'll definitely have to spend a lot of effort to do it. More more effort than most, I think. Um, right. Well, and you know, you mentioned how you know the tempo is different. Yeah, I can understand that. Right. Like shooting alpha. You know, shooting. Alpha's at a fast rate of speed and open is definitely more challenging, right? You, because the Charlie is only one point down, but it's still so you're still gonna like shooting against Christian, you're gonna lose if you shoot more Charlies than Alphas because he's gonna shoot all the Alphas. Yeah. I mean twenty Alphas and ten Charlies is, you know, no big deal in open. Like well mm-hmm. that's twenty points down if you're shooting uh minor, right? Well it's just now now all of a sudden it becomes a real thing. So um I, I would say that for most people switching between especially with two different 
you know, guns from the same manufacturer, I'm sure most people have no problem switching back and forth. And, you know, as long as you call your shot, you know, um, it shouldn't be different. But for me, again, five straight years of shooting um, one platform at a time, at least, um, mm-hmm. it, it just takes a little bit uh, longer for me. Like, even when I was switching from one 2011 to another, it would take me, like, a disgusting amount of time to get really in tune with that gun, like a month and a half of mm-hmm. shooting, like, two or three times a week. So... Um, I don't know what it is. I just maybe I'm just not adaptable or anything or something like that. But um, I will definitely be spending a lot of time behind the trigger when I switch between these platforms, just to be sure. Right. Well, and you want to make sure, right? You, you're going to spend all that time, investment, and effort. So you mm-hmm. might you want to perform well, right? Yeah. And I do find that the more I do it, uh, the the better I get at it. So again, it's just it's just, I think it's another skill, and it's something that I haven't really um, worked on much. But the, the year I shot CO Nats and and limit, uh, limited 10 nationals um that was one of my goals for the year was to get a little bit more familiar or at least a little bit more experience shooting other things so um mm-hmm. i'm getting a little bit better at it now so right well that's good too right getting you know always progressing right you know as soon as you know you are a, a gm and open right so you know that's one of the top of the top so like right you know because you got to be as fast and you got to be accurate right so and you got to be able to perform at that level it's not like you know, oh, I'm a GM in production, or sorry, GM in revolver, and I'm the top snop, and you're really like maybe an A class level shooter because <laughs> comparing yourself to everybody else. But when you're in open, you got to be able to go perform 100% of the time because your competition, your direct competition, is going to perform 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. not like those B class or C class, those B class heroes who can hook up every once in a while and have a good stage. Uh, I'm exactly. one of those. I'm one of <laughs> So, yeah. The, most of the guys are going to have very good matches, you know, at, at that level. Um, mm-hmm. And if you want to win, you just have to have an even better one and a more consistent one. So, right. um, yeah. But, you know, when it, when it comes to these matches, like, I, I always do what I have to do um, to to get where I want to get. So um, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time, and it's not going to be an issue for me. I'll, I'll be there. Right. Yeah. Thank you for watching another episode of Manny Talk Shooty. I greatly appreciate it. And if you could do me a favor, please go patronize our sponsors here when you are available. We've got Hunter's HD Gold, Go Fast, Don't Suck, Outdoor Dynamics, Make Stuff Better, Range Panda, Southern BBQ, Laugh and Load, Summit City Bullets, Two Alpha Apparel, and Tom Castro Shoot Academy. Now let's get back to this episode. Absolutely. So um, we did get some listener questions. I want to run through some of these, or most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh We'll start with, a, I think, an answer we've kind of already figured out. But what happened to the Bubblegum Shadow 2? Do you actually still have the gun? <laughs> oh, oh, he does. It's, it is a wall decoration now. So I still have it, yes. And it's actually right next to my my Bubblegum 3-gun uh, rifle as well. So <laughs> those guns are still up there. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, it's a nice gun for sure. Um, if I were shooting K-Optics, I'd be shooting it. But like I said, it's just a... It just, a little different for me. Um, so, yeah. again, we'll have to spend some time getting used to it. Uh, but, yeah. I still like the color, though. It's pretty sweet. I'm, yeah, well, and you think about it. It's got that battle-worn look somewhat to it, too. And it uh, yeah. So, it it it, uh, it doesn't look brand new. So, when you drop it on the ground, it'll be okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I throw it in the ground. No, I'm just kidding. When um, I throw it in that dump bucket. <laughs> <laughs> just toss it in there. Um I'm, I'm still trying to get David to coat me one in, in pink and blue, one of the masterpieces. He'll never do it, but, you know. We'll, just just go go over David's head. Just go to Phil. <laughs> I don't think yeah. Phil will let me do it either. I'm pretty sure he'll, uh, I'm pretty sure he'll smack me if I ask. Yeah, Although that, that would be cool, like a bubblegum pink grip. That would be really cool. Like, you know, because they've got that oh, swirly. They've oh, got yeah, that, yeah. They, they got him in, like, Red, blue, yellow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll have, we'll have pink in there somewhere. A little yeah. bit of a swirly. Yeah. I do have um. It's 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 a little bit rosy red, but it's it's supposed to, it's kind of like a pink uh, trigger that mm-hmm. uh, when they were doing some uh, experimentation with the cutter cutter at the time, uh, they were trying to get a red and it came out a little lighter. So I do mm-hmm. have like a pinkish trigger that I can. You know, hey, there you go. A little bit of pink. <laughs> so um, one person asks, "Who is your favorite iron sight shooter?" <laughs> I wonder who asked that. <laughs> you get one guess. You get three guesses, and your first two don't count. <laughs> well, first two don't count. My favorite iron shooter of all time. His name is Joey Sauerland. What a great guy! What a great oh. guy and a great shooter. Yeah, but you know it's funny because I was just hanging out with him this weekend, past weekend. Him and his cousin Michael. I'm like, between the two of you, you guys have a brain cell, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Which they acknowledged it. It was hilarious. I love Michael. So I, I met him at, I think it was Alabama sectional last mm-hmm. year. 
think that was the match. Yeah, he he stayed with us, and he's such an awesome guy, such a, such a nice dude. Um, had a great time spending the weekend with him. Um, but yeah, they're they're both really really funny. I, I've heard that he actually gets a lot. Uh, Joey actually gets a lot of his mannerisms from Michael, which is which I thought was funny. Which uh, yeah, but when I find that Michael's the more uh, nor- not not to say that Joey's not normal, the more uh, the more <laughs> mature one from time to time. But he seemed like it. I mean, he was pretty mature at the time. I, I think he was maybe you know he was he was newer. Uh, yeah. to, to the to the crew so uh he was being a little bit more mature maybe but i'd love to see the real michael at some point yeah well and just like i say i tell i tell greg to his face i'm like it's okay you're more mature than joey sometimes it's okay sometimes yeah sometimes it depends on the day <laughs> then, you, then you forget that greg's like maybe 22 and it's like I, i'm pretty sure he's a junior shooter still yeah. <laughs> He gets carded when we go out. <laughs> well, it wouldn't surprise it wouldn't surprise me. He's got a baby face. Sorry, Greg. Yeah, and I know he'll listen to this, so he'll be like, "Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, we love Greg." We um, he needs to grow out a beard like I do, and that'll 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 age him a little bit. Mm-hmm. When when back before I had my beard, I, everyone said I had a baby face too. So I don't know. I guess yeah, you do. There's <laughs> one of the things about your uh, like this the the browser that we're using to record this. Mm-hmm. It was like a beautify. <laughs> oh yes, the beautify filter. Yeah, I turned that on on the preview. I turned it all the way up, and I was like, "Damn, I do look pretty good here." Don't I? <laughs> but uh, I didn't want to turn it on. I just felt like it was kind of cheap. So. Yeah. So Joey did want to know when will you start taking ice baths? Uh, <clears throat> whenever I visit Joey at his at his crib for the first time and get in that RGB ice bath that he's got, mm-hmm. I'm in. So every once in a while, we'll go to an Airbnb that has a pool that's not heated. And it'll be mm-hmm. really cold, and I will jump into that. But I think I'm totally overestimating how cold it is. Like I, I, t- I told Joey it was like 40 degrees, but it was probably like 50, and I'm just like freezing my ass off at 50 degrees even. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'd be down to try it for sure. Right. Well, I mean, you, or you could be like Jay Beal and step on Legos with your bare feet. I've seen that. I saw that one. Yeah. I'm like, no, thank you, Jay. You were insane. Yeah, that was that was kind of crazy. I mean, props to him for being able to endure that. I have Legos and I stepped on them all the time growing up and it's not fun. Yeah, no, that is not fun. Yeah. Or, or you lose a piece and then you you spend hours looking for the one piece and oh, you're like, yeah. where is the piece? Yeah. Well, I've done enough sets where I could just like step on all the extra pieces that they give you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've got, I've got a few, I got like a Death Star over there that I've built. So, oh, so do you have, so is the Death Star your favorite or is that the one you can just see from uh, here? I don't know why I said Death Star. I meant the Millennium Falcon. Sorry. Okay. I mean, yeah. either either or, like the really big ones. It's like, not the huge one. It's okay. not the it's not the really big one. I, that's why I said I was thinking of that eight hundred dollar Death Star that came out a few years ago. Maybe someday. Maybe someday I'll get that one. Maybe someday, and then you have to make sure you never move because, like, <laughs> you don't ever have to want to disturb it or take it apart. Or yeah. Well, I will just live in it, so I think I think that'd be fine. I don't think that I'll have a problem moving it. <laughs> that would be funny. All right, let's see. I've got. I know I've got one more question. They sent me enough words that I actually had to actually set, they had to send me a physical message instead of doing the prompt, which is okay. So, are people listening to this now, like live? No, 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 the no. People that are oh, like they they just they just ask the questions ahead of time. I got you. Yep. Yeah, I don't. Sorry. I will never. I I do a live stream on every Thursday, as everybody uh-huh. knows. But yeah. I'm letting you know is I. I for heaven forbid, like if something if we said something we really didn't like at the end of the day, I can edit that out, no problem here. But um, yeah, that's why I don't ever really do a podcast live. Now yeah. I'll do a live stream with my buddy Corey as my co-host, and we'll we'll talk. And if it rips, it rips. But like I I, I don't know. I want everyone to feel comfortable too. It's like oh I said that, but I really didn't mean it. So can you take it out? Like there's one show I did. I took out like a good six minutes because uh, we were I was. <laughs> It wasn't that it was bad. It was um, the person wanted their intellectual property protected. I'm like, absolutely, yeah, I'll I'll take that out. We we yeah. talked a little too close to what you're willing to give away for free, so yeah, which doesn't bother me. So you probably know this guy. Um, if you don't, I, this is Billy Harrington asking this question. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so I guess I should read the whole question or the whole statement because it makes more sense that way. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is his statement to you. Uh, you've always been an amazing shooter and competitor. However, since last late last year, open that something changed. You've become electric and an absolute monster behind the gun. What discovery in your shooting journey happened? Is it mental, physical, technical, or is it a combination? Oh, since open nationals last year or 
Yeah, at least that's how they phrase the, they phrase their statement. So okay, I I didn't love my performance at nationals last year. Maybe he was talking about the one before that. I got mm-hmm. two two nationals ago. I got seventh, and then last year um, I had a few really bad stages and got eleventh, which is you know I was I was happy with the uh, the result uh, relative to how I performed. Um, honestly, I I'm not sure exactly what I did to get there. I just know that I worked really hard over the last year or two to get to where I am today. I don't know if I can say it's really one thing, but I do know, I do know the one thing that changed in my performance that led to, um, uh, good results was my consistency. And that's really like the big jump between a high level M shooter and like a good GM shooter is the consistency, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like you said, an M class shooter can hook up and beat a bunch of GMs on a stage but can they do that for 18 stages? And the consistency is really where um, you're going to get good match results because you have to shoot 10 good stages in a row uh, to win a major, um, or to win most majors, I would say. Um, And I think that really just comes with uh, just honing in your fundamentals. Um, A lot of people go to a major and they want to beat that one guy that they see um, on the list that's a high level GM or whatever. And then they try to push speed at that match. Um, at the end of the day, your skill level is whatever your skill level is. All the prep work that you've done going into that major happened before you got to the major. So you're not going to get a 10% boost, uh, in your average expected result at that match. The only thing you can try to do is to have a calm mental and, uh, shoot consistently at your, best shooting skill level, which is about 90 to 95% of your skill level. I mean, that, that number changes on who you talk to. And that's kind of just, uh, like a, a fine middle ground that you have to find for yourself. Um, but you, you want to find that Zen mode and shoot all of the stages in that. And I actually remember, um, South Carolina sectional, I think two, maybe three years ago, Mm-hmm. The first match where that I shot the entire match, and at the end of that match, I said, "Dang, like I was in my Zen mode for that entire match. Like I just found like my perfect match mode at that match." Um, don't really know how I did it. I think it was, again, it was just all the preparation and the practice I did leading up to that. But it finally just clicked for me, and I spent that entire year just match moding. I didn't, I didn't do any speed mode that whole year because I just wanted to maintain that that Zen mode, and I did it all the way through that nationals, and that's that year that I got seventh place, and I believe that was twenty twenty two if I remember my years correctly. Um, and then after that, I started messing around with um, pushing and finding my new 100% again um, and and practicing some more speed mode and then ba- kind of bouncing back, back and forth between that and my accuracy mode and my match mode. Um, so just doing a little a lot more growing uh, on top of that because you can't just stay in your match mode 100% all the time. You, you do need to keep growing and keep expanding and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's all it is. And then once you get to a certain point, like I said, you're not going to, you're not going to shave time by going faster anymore. Like you're not going to outrun the next guy or split faster than the next guy. So it's all those little, um, dead time efficiencies that you need to create for yourself. And that all really comes from efficiency and movement and efficiency and transitions. And, um, <laughs> that's something I've said probably a thousand times. Cause I just had a class, uh, this past weekend uh, at Brock's gap. Um, I'll do those every once in a while, every few months, but that's really the core of the class is working on those and figuring out how to, uh, how to perfect that and, uh, and, and how to train so that you can improve that over the next you know year or so. So, mm-hmm. yeah. no, and that's what a lot of people need. They need to be able to find those little inefficiencies and, and whittle those down. I've got plenty of them, right? I know I need to whittle them down. <laughs> like I, I, I know that's one of my biggest gaps. It's not necessarily my consistency, but it's definitely, you know, like one of my big things right now is getting those eyes ahead of the gun, right? Not being sucked behind the gun. Get the eyes moving so that you can transition more accurately at a faster rate and, and you know, not be sucked behind that gun. Like, that is one of my biggest things. It's like, you know, you over you over transition because you're, you're you and the gun are completely connected. Not saying you, but I mean the example is completely connected in the gun and you're looking through it, but it's still like, oh, that's why I'm having, you know, there's those issues or you know, not looking, having a good plan, right? Or not knowing how to make a good plan or God, there's so many things that, you know, that everyone can do to be more efficient. Yeah. I I love that you brought that up because that resonates with me so hard. Like the leading with your eyes thing, especially, um, Mm -hmm. 
So I, I have broken my transition like practice routine into like four different sections and that's one section and really like they get subgrouped into two. I don't know. It's this whole thing. But, um, I, even me, like I caught myself doing that at Ipsic nationals this past year in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Um, I totally psyched myself at that match. Uh, my first couple of days were kind of eh, like not great. I didn't love them. Uh, actually looking back at it, I hated my day one because I saw a bunch of low hit factors and I've been experimenting with some hit factor strategy um, reached out to Grafell even and talked to him and it like his his strategy totally works but I'm just not I wasn't at the level of skill yet where I could uh, like turn a switch and shoot like one way on one stage you know I, I kind of just I shoot my best when I just call the shots whenever I can and just shoot them right without overthinking it and I definitely overthink think thunk I definitely overthought at Ipsic Nationals, and that first day, I saw a bunch of low hit factors in the threes, fours, and fives, and I said, "Oh, I really need to get my points here. I need to get all my points." And I shot super slow, and I actually looked back, and pretty sure I was following my dot with my eyes that entire day. Like I was not leaving my eyes, and I suspect that I was also looking for bullet holes. So I totally went like the opposite way of what I'm normally and naturally used to, um, like my shooting style, and that definitely hurt me. But I started finding it a little bit more on day two and three and made up a lot of ground um, and ended up at eighth, which again, for, um, for my performance, I think is a respectable uh, placement. Right. And it's one that I'm happy with ultimately. So, uh, mm -hmm. but the more I shoot these nationals, cause I've probably shot like, I don't know, seven nationals at this point. And every time I shoot one, I learn so much. And I think I learned the most from this nationals. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, totally revamp my training program and everything. So, uh, definitely looking forward to that and you know, putting that into effect. Right. That, and that'll be cool. Right. And then you'll get to that next, that next step in your training. Right. Like, you know, you know, if you think about it, like average listeners who are listening to this guys, just remember, you know, there's average shooters and then there's really good shooters, but even the really good shooters have to find a new level. Right. Christian just doesn't come out there and be like, well, I'm Christian. I'm going to stand on my laurels. He's going to find that next step of Christian, right? He's going to find that goal or that next obtainable thing for him so then he can wipe the floor with everybody else again. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm, I'm very dirty from how much I get wiped with by Christian, but <laughs> um, no, he, he's awesome, man, for sure. Um, he just does some crazy things every time I shoot with him. Um, mm -hmm. He does awesome stuff, and I dream of getting uh, close to that level. Any, like anywhere close to that level at some point so um yeah we'll see right so um speaking of that how many times have you been on the super the open super squad then uh just twice if i recall um so the year i got seventh again um i shot super squad the next year uh sorry i got 13th one year shot super squad got that was my first time ever got seventh Mm -hmm. I think I shoot better when I'm shooting with those guys. And then I got 11, so I'll shoot Super Squad again this year. Um, at Ipsic Nats, uh, it was a little bit weird because they opened up registration first, and then mm -hmm. they emailed me and said, do you want to be on the Super Squad? And I was already in a squad, and I was already um, with some MPA guys and kind of settled in, so I just said, no, nah, it's, it's cool. Like, I'll just I'll pass for this one. But um, for USPA St. Nationals this year, I'll definitely be shooting with those guys again. Right. Well, and as you said, you shoot better with those guys, with the uh, super squad guys is because you know, everyone's going to shoot the same plan. Like you have the most efficient plan. No, I, I do the opposite of what they all do. <laughs> it's, <laughs> okay. it's so weird. Like, um, so Brian Jones apparently used to be known as the guy that had interesting plans and he tells me that I have weird plans. So that's saying something, <laughs> but, um, I, I still remember the first day, first stage of shooting nationals last year. Um, every, I don't know if you, I remember stage one from from that match but it was kind of like a big circle and you start in the back middle and every one of the other guys went left and then came around and then ended up on this one mini popper on the right and i was the only guy on the squad that went to the right first <laughs> did some weird things so i mean at the end of the day um i just shoot what i feel is comfortable for me i always say that stage plans are very um i mean it's catered to the individual shooter like based on your skill level, based on what you're comfortable with. Like some people hate leaving on steel. Some people don't mind it. They hate entering on hard target instead. Um, so I think everyone has different, uh, yeah, at, at, at the end of the day, it really depends on your execution, right? Unless there's like some crazy way to game a stage. Most stage plans are similar. There will be some efficiencies here and there, but 
for the most part, um, I think execution is king. And I think the Super Squad guys generally do tend to shoot similar stage plans because um, I, I believe it's because you don't want to risk losing a stage because you thought you were right, but the other 11 guys were right and you were maybe in the wrong. So if everyone's shooting the same stage plan, at least it really just comes down to the skill, right? Mm-hmm. Your execution. Um, and I, I believe that is that's uh, what causes that. But um, I don't know. At this point, I just if I have a stage plan and I like it and I've already visualized it a bunch, I'm probably not going to change that plan once I get there on the day of. So, Right, yeah, and, that, and that's true. Just stick to your plan, know what you're comfortable with, and it will 99% pay off, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Mike, we're near the end of our time allotment here for the day, but I do have a couple more questions. Yeah, shoot. Um, so I know this is a super personal question, I mean, not a you know super like personal into your personal life, but what does your make ready look like? Oh man, I'm still evolving it, and and I I don't know if it's too long. I don't know if I have like a super GM make ready or, or whatever. Um, so I get up there, and I actually do this thing where I rack the gun a bunch. And uh, when I see, shoot these episode matches, the arrows always give me funny looks because you can't dry fire the gun. On the make ready, so I've been going to a lot of ISIC matches, and then I, some of them tell me that I'm not allowed to do that, like not even allowed to direct the gun. So, but that's normally what I do. Um, I will load my mag, uh, you know, take it out and put a new one if I'm barning up, and then I usually do a press check just to make sure. I mean, you don't really need to do it, but I mean, it doesn't hurt either. I, I do that. I press check my gun. I, I don't know why. It just makes me feel good. You know, mm-hmm. I just want to do it, man. Just let me do it. <laughs> and some people hate it. I don't know what it is. But, but um, So I'll do that. But then the most important part is when I put the gun down, right? So sometimes if it's a really complex stage, I'll run through the stage one more time in my head just really quick. Just one last visualization because the only thing I want to do once a buzzer goes off is call shots. Um, and then I have a keyword that I tell myself. Um, and it's evolved over the years. It used to be like full control, like just for me, and that's what worked. So if I told myself full control, then I wouldn't try to go too fast or, or faster than I need to go. Um, and I would call on my shots and everything. Now I tell myself like all alphas usually, um, again, like it just works for me. I don't, it's not going to make me actually get all alphas and shoot slow for me. Um, if I just tell myself to get all alphas then I'll actually aim at the alpha, of a target instead of just putting it somewhere in the brown, which is what I'm used to doing. Um, it forces me to aim actually at the score that I'm trying to hit. Makes my uh, accuracy much better. It makes my shot calling better, and actually makes my shooting faster because I can just call a shot and get out of there, transition to the next target, or get out of that position immediately if I call a good shot. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once I tell myself that, uh, <laughs> I started doing this little stretch thing that some people might have noticed. I don't know what it is, but it just it wakes me up, you know. When I shoot my worst matches, I look back and it's because I just wasn't focused. Like I was kind of tired. I had some brain fog. And for whatever reason, doing that little stretch for me uh, just like helps me wake my brain up a little bit so I can just be a little bit more sharp. Um, and so I do that. And then I just try to calm myself and then you know tell myself that all alpha or full control thing or whatever. And then I just go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I definitely like the keyword thing. I think I first learned that from Steve Anderson in one of his older podcasts. Um, mm-hmm. I, I used to listen to him religiously. I still listen to his show from time to time. Um, it's a great show, and he's still preaching the word. So it's 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 awesome for sure. Um, I, I learned a lot when I was first starting out, especially. Um, and I think I learned that keyword thing from him. So I've been using it for years, and the, the keyword just changes, or key phrase, or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and it, and it always depends on how you're feeling and what you're you're going through too, right? Now, yeah. not everyone needs the same key phrase or keyword, but uh, exactly, exactly, it definitely can help. So, Mike, um, this oh, this is where I was going with that. So, this is the part where I let you, you know, plug your sponsors, your partners, you know, people you want to shout out at this point. Oh, awesome! Yeah, thanks so much. So. Uh, I'm going to start with Masterpiece Arms. I've been with Masterpiece for just over a year now. Uh, March was my one-year anniversary with them, which was awesome. Um, they've been so good to me, uh, you know, not only just in providing the guns, but providing so much support. Uh, Phil is awesome. He will, like, check scores every once in a while and just, like, hit me up and, like, tell me congratulations. And I didn't – like, at first I was like, I didn't even know you are looking at the scores, but he's following us and 
and watching us. He, he cares how we do. So that, that's awesome. Great support from him. And then Lauren, obviously, she comes to matches with us and, and supports us. And um, she, she, she will get me fruit at Walmart and, and feed it to me throughout the match because it, it fruit really does wonders for me. Like, it's something I learned from Travis, actually. Travis, mm-hmm. I was having issues with um, getting really tired at right around noon, every single match, when it, when it was a full day match, and I was getting sugar crashes, I just didn't know it at the time. So he told me to do that, and now Lauren always like forces me to eat fruit every stage, which is awesome because sometimes I'll forget. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, they've been so good to me. Everyone on everyone on that um, on the match piece team has been awesome. Um, I'm so fortunate to be working with them. Um, and then uh, Excalibur, I just started working with them as well. Um, so just started working with Rob. And he has been awesome. I mean, he's a great guy as well, uh, for sure. And um, he really believes in me. I can tell by the, by the way he talks to me. So that, that's awesome for sure. Um, Hoover Tactical Firearms, they've been with me since the beginning. They were my first uh, sponsor, actually. And um, they provide support in more ways than most people probably realize. Um, but um, Carrie over there has been really awesome to us. And uh, and and very supportive right and then we've got a lot of partners as well so hunters brian and hunters has been supporting me for a while he, his shop is actually like 20 30 minutes from my house as well so i actually went and visited him a couple times um awesome dude and he, he's been supporting me for a while um and then we've got ray at zero sports for the jerseys awesome jerseys super comfortable um and those hoodies that he's come out with recently are sweet like that's all i wear now like i don't i don't wear the collared jerseys much anymore i just wear the hooded ones Mm-hmm. Um, long sleeves protection from the sun and everything so that's awesome and then isotunes as well um obviously we i talked about them early in the podcast but isotunes with some awesome ear pro um i use the caliber bts and i put the defy, defy slims over so i just use a double up with them um and gum butter is what we use in our guns as well um just can't beat it 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 does its job and um it's really uh, temperature like adaptive and everything. So um, I never have a problem. I used to have some issues when I was using different kinds of lubes um, in the winters, they would start to like gum up a little bit and I have some jams on the first couple of stages that I match. And with this, like it's no problem with that. So they've been awesome as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is everyone. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. It's good to see those companies supporting you, standing behind you, standing with you. It's a, uh, it's cool to see that they have your support, you know, and they're going to support you and do what they can for you, and vice versa, right? So that's always a good thing about being on a team as well. You know, you've got your your teammates and and the whole company behind you too. So that's sweet. Yeah, I mean it's 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 cool because like I you know I talk to you know somebody or multiple people from each of, each of those and like. I just feel the love when I talk to them, you know, like, it's not just like, Oh, here, here's the product, do your thing, uh, represent us, do a good job at matches. Like, no, it's not, it's not like that at all. It's, um, it's definitely like, you know, good vibes and everything. So mm-hmm. definitely very fortunate. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, Mike, if people want to get a hold of you, they want to talk to you about corgis, open guns, you know, whatever, um, where's the best place for them to reach you? Um, I think the best place to reach me is probably on Instagram uh, or Facebook. Uh, my Instagram handle is just at Mike Wong, like my name, M I K E H W A N G. Um, and then my Facebook is just my name. I don't know if you'll find me there or not. If you type in Mike Wong, I'm not really sure. But yeah, definitely a good place to reach me. Um, or if you know me and have my cell phone number, just hit me up there. Mm-hmm. 867 5309, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in this day and age, I, don't, I mean, a million people probably have my phone number, right? Like, data companies and whatnot are selling it left and right, so whatever, you know, it's fine. Yeah. It's out there somewhere. I'm sure you find it. Just, uh, you know, we're calling you about your car's extended <laughs> warranty. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But Mike, brother, thank you for coming on and hanging out with me and chit chatting about you know anything we really wanted to talk about. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, man, dude, this was truly awesome. I like. It's, you know, I, I didn't realize that an hour and a half had flown by so much, but I, had, I just had such a good time chatting with you and, uh, you know, talking a little bit about my history and, and whatnot and learning a little bit more about you as well. So this was awesome, man. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's been a blast. And that's what I try to make these casual, fun conversations that we all can enjoy. And, you know, the person listening in the car, you might want to listen to this at two times speed because you got to get to work or something because it's, <laughs> it's going to be 9 a.m. probably by the time you listen to it. So, yeah. Yeah, no problem, Mike. Thank you again, brother. And to the listeners, 
Get out and do things. I'll see you on the next one. See you out there. Thanks so much.